there is a rush to use LLMs for everything. Yeah. You don't need an LLM for most AI applications that you're trying to build. Usually when there's new technology, if you don't know anything about the technology, you are afraid of it and you know a lot about the technology, you're like, no, no, this is safe to use. Uh, this is actually the first time where it's inverted. If you don't know anything about the technology, you're really excited. I mean, I love ChatGPT. I can ask it a lot yeah. of questions, right? At the same time, if you're an expert in what the technology is capable of, there is definitely concern from the experts. Hello and welcome everyone to the next episode of the A Media House podcast, Simulated Reality. Today we have with us a leader from Cisco, Anand Raghavan. Hi Anand, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing well. Fantastic. Great to have you Anand. Today we are going to talk about what AI uh, technology will work in 2024. Uh, and it's a perfect uh, point of point in time to have this conversation considering that there are so many trends and hype going around, uh, especially with the advent of generative AI. Uh, it's an important perspective to learn from leaders like you, what is the reality and what will it actually scale and what will we build. So to start off with, right, uh, I want to set the context for our audience understand what are some of the trends in the past one year, five years and 10 years that have overall defined where we stand today. Why, why is it in 2024 or 2023 we reached this point where we couldn't start talking about LLMs and probably AGI became a conversation which people are uh, you know, more uh, talking about it more realistically. Yeah, so I mean, this trace back to more than 30, 40 years, right? I mean, whether you call it decision support systems, machine learning, AI, you know, Gen AI, it has been a progression in terms of technology over several decades. Um, and when you talk about AI in general, there's at least four categories in which you can put this, right? The first is statistical techniques, anomaly detection, finding outliers, things like that. That's been there forever and will continue to be there. Um, then you have the traditional machine learning techniques, classifiers, for example, spam is a, is a binary classifier and you could have multimodal classifiers and things like that. Then you have more computer vision kind of algorithms which are more image focused. Uh, you have natural language based techniques like identifying sentiment or named entity recognition and things like that. And then of course you have the more modern wave of the neural networks and uh, generative AI and large language models and all of that. Um, uh, as you think about it historically, like ImageNet was one of those first times when you saw what neural networks could do, that very quickly recognizing faces, recognizing objects in images starting early 2010s became a reality. And we started on that progression with language, uh, with sequences, sequence transformers in Google Translate, then we had the attention is all you need paper, but then the most recent wave comes from the ChatGPT launch in November 2022, right? Um, and this is critical in the sense that this is the first time that you can actually talk to a computer in a language that you know, and have it take actions on your behalf instead of having to learn a whole new set of languages to be able to interact with a computer. And, and that has opened up this whole new world of possible applications that can you can build using this interface. Whenever we talk about technology, uh, especially when it comes to things that need to scale, there is a word which many media and analysts firms use, which is the readiness of it, right? Technology readiness. What according to you defines technology readiness uh, for any, uh, where does that word come from? What does that exactly mean in the context of you know enabling it in organizations? Yeah, so readiness stems from a, a few different vectors, right? I mean, starting with the governance aspect. Um, when you're when you're building any AI model, the data that you use to train the models is what is most important. And are you using it responsibly? Do you have the right kind of controls in place? Are you anonymizing the data that uh, you need to anonymize, or are you getting the consent from the customers before you're using it? as part of your training. Um, are you sending it to any third party processor? So all of that fits into the governance aspect of it, right? Second is uh, associated with that is auditability. Do you know what kind of uh, Gen AI activities are going on inside of your organization for you to know if uh, they can be governed in the right manner or not, right? So visibility into all of that becomes another important aspect of that. Then it comes to the infrastructure readiness. Do you know what kind of infrastructure you need to be able to run these kinds of models? How effectively can you run it? How uh, cost efficient can you run it, right? Um, and then you have the application layer where you're thinking about what kind of applications do you want to build that use large language models. Now, there is a rush to use LLMs for everything. Uh, you don't need an LLM for most AI applications that you're trying to build. So are you trying to really solve a customer pain point for which you need an LLM, or are you just running after the latest shiny object because that's what everybody is doing, right? That's another important part of the readiness, which is uh, the awareness of what technology to use where and making sure that the, you have the right guardrails in place for it to be used in the right way by the customer. And then that continuous feedback process of 
learning from customer feedback on what is working, what is not working to make your models better. So based on some of the parameters that you just mentioned, right, uh, it could be infrastructure, it could be availability of several tech stack layers in the tech stack, the organizational readiness, which of these parameters would you handpick in terms of identifying what technologies will work in 2024? And based on that, why, why, why especially Gen AI is, has become a serious topic of discussion? Yeah, yeah. So the, uh, so the first thing is, um, there are some applications for which you will need the frontier models. You will need a GPT-4 um, or you will need a GPT-3.5 because you are trying to generate a response that presumes knowledge of the whole internet, presumes an understanding of a lot of details in language, right? So let's say I'm trying to summarize a large body of text into a few words. Things like that, you will need a large language model. There are many scenarios where you may not need a trillion parameter model, uh, like a few billion parameter model like a Mistral, is good enough, right? And then the question becomes, okay, can you use it out of the box? Do you need to fine tune it? Do you need to build a custom model based on the open source model? Uh, that's another set of uh, criteria for people to think about, right? There might be some other scenarios where you can use much smaller models, like take an Electra model, train it with the particular kinds of uh, domain specific tasks that you're trying to do and launch an application that uh, is particularly targeted towards that, right? That's another approach you can take in the market. So these are different ways in which you can launch language model based applications in the market. Um, along with each of these things, a, a few constituent pieces need to be built around it, right? First is again, identifying the right sets of data, making sure that data is tagged properly, uh, the right set of data is being used to train the models. Uh, second is um, the controls that you have in place to build feedback loops around what the customer is uh, responding to in terms of the prompts that they got and the responses they got, uh, thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, uh, how are you training the models based on customer feedback? That's another important aspect of that. The third is to make sure that you have guardrails in place to prevent any abuse of the product itself, right? To make sure that prompt induction attacks don't happen, uh, toxicity uh, uh, and other kinds of abuse uh, by uh, attackers of your ecosystem. That's another important part of it as well. Correct. And uh, while, while you do mention that some of these uh, parameters are coming together to enable Gen AI in the real world. A lot of things, a lot of technologies, especially that saw hype in the past couple of years, right? I don't know whether we were ready for it or what the readiness index for it was, especially considering uh, the likes of AR, VR or blockchain and all that. But why did the hype around those die? Because it's it's not like they did not work, like because we're trying to identify what technology will work in 2024. It's not like they, they did not work, they did work, but then why did they not scale or why did they not hype? And then why do you think Gen AI will be the other, uh, or do you think Gen AI will see the other, other side of it? A great question. I think whenever we go through a new technology cycle, um, hype is inevitable. Yeah? When we are trying to understand and come to terms with what this technology is capable of, uh, what is the um, market potential of being the first to market with something like this? Uh, there's always a gold rush that comes in, right? And and with every all the all the examples that you mentioned, that did happen, right? But all of the examples that you mentioned do have real world applications that people are chasing today, right? Um, so it does go through that initial hype of everybody jumping in and trying to use it in places where they shouldn't be using it, or claiming that they're doing it so they can raise money, build a bunch of startups. But eventually, it settles down. It settled down to real world applications where there is actual value coming out of it, right? They are going through the same thing here. Um, uh, you don't need an LLM for everything that uh, you're trying to do. But at the same time, there are several scenarios where it can it can make uh, your life easy. We are already seeing some of those examples in the media where uh, needle in the haystack kind of scenario. So you have people dumping a whole bunch of symptoms that they saw for a pet onto ChatGPT and ChatGPT coming back with these are probably the, uh, the likely diseases that these could correlate to. And uh, the vet actually saying that, yes, one of these was actually the problem, right? Or uh, summarizing large bodies of text to be able to quickly understand what is uh, being said in a particular document. Or removing mundane tasks from people's lives in terms of uh, doing a lot of repetitive work uh, from, let's look at the, uh, the legal area and looking at what paralegals are doing. The ability to write briefs very quickly based on a lot of data that is coming in. Uh, there are real applications uh, and, and those will continue to be built and those will continue to become enduring companies and products in the market. Correct. And what, what is, is there a way to kind of identify which technology might be just hype on this thing? What are some of the characteristics? Because you have seen the history of some of these technologies not making it 
after a certain point of time. While there is always a hype cycle, as you mentioned, you know, startup start investing, there's a lot of demand from board of directors towards CEOs and then CDOs and then them demanding those technologies, which kind of then money passes on to the different vendors and there's a lot of, you know, service providers or product companies, startups that kind of start offering. In this entire cycle of spending money to kind of start building this application, one of the things that I've always heard is it's important to have a five to ten year vision, like what it will look like in a, in the coming uh, years. Like don't look at it as a you know just a toy that will you that will fix something very quickly. What are some of the characteristics of the technologies that might not work, uh, and how do you kind of sense them as a technologist? You've been in the industry for so long. You've sensed that, and you know this. This is probably not. This is just hype. This is not going to go beyond. Um, I think the probably one of the important things to look for is: is it a hammer looking for a nail? Right. Um, if you if you start with a customer pain point and try to see, okay, this is a real pain point that exists in the market today, and how do I solve it? And maybe there was a point in time where you could not solve it because certain pieces of technology were not available. And today, this piece of technology fits in very nicely to be able to productize something to solve for that customer pain point. That is a good piece of technology to apply for a real world problem, right? Versus trying to create and imagine a scenario where this technology may or may not be needed, where it is not tied specifically to what a customer pain point is, right? To take a real example, if you're booking a vacation and you're traveling somewhere for a week, there is a certain set of steps that you need to do, whatever the trip is. You've got to figure out the cheapest ticket. You've got to figure out, or at least the comfortable ticket that you want. Price may not be the only vector you're looking at. You've got to figure out uh, where you're staying. And you probably have preferred airlines, preferred uh, uh, hotel chains that you want to uh, stay at, right? Now, this is usually done by human really well if you had a travel agent to work with. Now, that is a pain point that you could automate with an agent kind of a framework with large language models that can actually go and um, uh, over APIs, explore options across all of these providers and come up with possible alternatives for you. Now, that's an example of a real pain point that is out there in the market. Or if you are looking at the enterprise world and you're looking at a scenario where somebody is trying to work with a, a product or a solution built by uh, a company where uh, they are trying to understand how to use the product. Now, searching through pages and pages of documentation may not be as efficient as asking a question and Gen AI summarizing that and giving you a response back that saves you time and helps you use the product more effectively, right? So uh, things like that are real use cases, right? So starting with the customer pain point and making sure that this is the right technology to use for the pain point is a good way to judge, is this a technology that's going to be enduring or not? But are there not technologies that were started off with a customer pain point? I don't think there are any technologies which are started off with someone by not identifying a pain point, right? Yes and no. I think today what you're seeing is, like I'll give you a really good example, right? Uh, in the rush to launch ChatGPT powered applications, every company is slapping a UI on top of OpenAI and calling it that they have a bot, right? Now, the challenge there is they're not built it right. Um, it is not built with the right set of enterprise guardrails. So for example, if your company launched a chat application, by just putting a wrapper around OpenAI and give me access to that. Um, that's a free access to OpenAI that I'm getting if you haven't put in any guardrails. I can ask any kinds of questions, not anything related to, to your company, right? So you could be running up a bill, but I get a lot done, right? So this is the year when people are going to realize that it is not as simple as putting a wrapper around OpenAI. To build a real application, you got to uh, surround it with the right set of guardrails, the right set of customer use cases to make sure that it's a real application, right? Uh, and that will be the true measure of success of a piece of technology like this, right? Okay. So I think what you're trying to say is essentially, uh, obviously, every technology, like uh, people, are, people are not going to put in money when when there is no problem statement to solve. But the problem statement needs to be defined really well. Correct. Right? Correct. And you need to really understand the root cause of the problem rather than just the overall, uh, you know, at the surface of what this can look like and what, why it will be cool or something like that. In the short run, AI washing is easy. You yeah. can just put a bunch of buzzwords on your website and claim that uh, yeah. you have AI in your product. In the long run, unless it is providing real value, because to, to, to take a specific example, if you look at margins, if I'm building a product that is uh, light on AI, the chances are I have much better margins than if I'm building a product that is heavy on AI. 
because of cost of running the compute, uh, the cost of in this particular case, uh, just all the open AI bills that you rack up, right? So if you are just using it to AI wash and you have not really thought through whether you need it or not, it is going to impact your bottom line, okay. right? And at some point you will have to think about, is it really bringing value? And is this something you should continue to build? Correct. And I think one of the things that I have observed in a, in a lot of sense, right? So there are two sides to it. One is uh, there is the uh, there is the big large enterprises, right? These are Fortune 500 companies who have generated sizable revenues to kind of be able to experiment around. Then there is another stakeholder like the media who is calling out this, you know, Gen AI, Gen AI, Gen AI, and then making a big fuss out of it. And then there is the vendors. And what I've observed is once that buzz is created, Right. And then there is this, because no Fortune 500 wants to be left behind in a competitor, especially when it comes to newer technology. So then there is a pressure from the top to say that, you know what, I need this technology. I'm not going to miss out on before my competitor does. And then probably there are false promises from the vendor side. I, I wouldn't like to call, call it false, but like, you know, hyped up promises from this thing. And then there is an expectation mismatch and in this entire scenario we are not really observing the the problem in hand right and probably that is called that is what is causing uh, the entire uh, you know not technology is not being able to scale it is a combination of all of these factors right so uh, if you look at uh, use cases inside of an enterprise where uh, you are thinking about how a developer's productivity can go up using GitHub Copilot. Right? That's a no-brainer. Use cases like that will be there, right? Or you look at automating QA or um, um, ML ops or DevOps. Mm -hmm. There are internal use cases where AI in general and Gen AI specifically can help, right? And companies that are building those products, uh, there is definitely value to those, uh, enduring value to those, right? Then there is value that I'm trying to bring as a Fortune 500 or a Global 2000 or whatever sized company to my end customers, right? How am I using Gen AI or AI towards that, right? That's where more thought needs to go in. Like mo most of our discussion so far has been around that. Am I actually using this technology in a scenario where um, it really brings value for my customer? Do I really need to use Gen AI to provide that value, right? Um, if you look at the vendors in the ecosystem that are building these tools, right? There is definitely an ecosystem around this now um, where uh, you have uh, vendors that are looking at it from a security perspective, from a relevance perspective, from uh, automation of your uh, tool chain perspective, right? Uh, from model evaluation perspective, all of these are needed right now. Yes, there is um, an explosion of startups being built in each of these categories. It will stabilize to a few that actually have a differentiated value and they will continue to build uh, enduring companies out there. That's just like any new technology curve that we see where initially there's a bunch of funding that, that goes in and then a bunch of winners come out of that. Correct. Um, realistically, what do you see uh, Gen AI to be used in, in five years, ten years, right? Uh, I'm talking from the context of enterprises. I really want to understand your perspective on that. Uh, when I ask this, uh, trying to ask you what are some of the use cases, what are some of the areas where it will be successful, where are some of the areas it might not work out, um, that kind of thing. Yeah, so places where it can definitely provide value is places where you have customers that are using a product that is difficult to use or a product where there is a lot of capability that you need to navigate to get something done, right? Or workflows where there's a lot of steps in the workflow and for a human, it takes a long time to go across all of those workflows, right? If you take an example of um, a tier one analyst in a SOC, a tier one analyst compared to a tier three analyst is not as experienced. Now you have a severe shortage of people in the uh, tier three analyst uh, uh, regime in the US. So how do you empower a tier one analyst to perform beyond what they uh, know today as a tier one analyst, right? Uh, in scenarios like that, Gen AI based tools can actually provide a lot of value by uh, summarizing context for them across a lot of different data sources, by giving them recommendations on what to do next, by trying to identify patterns in the data and highlighting to them that this is something that they might need to look at, by reducing the volume of alerts that they see and only prioritizing alerts that are relevant to them. Right? So scenarios like that, where it is coming in as an aid to help them with their job. Right? Um, if you take a simple example in email security, if you're looking at, you know, all of us click on that report phishing button at work when we see an email that looks malicious. Right? Um, in many companies, it goes to a bunch of analysts that have to sit and look at them and determine if it's a real phishing email or not. Um, I have talked to analysts who used to look at 2000 emails a day manually to figure out if they are really phishing emails or not. And 80% of the time they are not. 
is some employee unhappy with a particular email, marketing email that came in and clicking on that button, right? How do you automate that for them? Nobody wants to look at 2,000 emails a day manually, right? If you can get it down to say 10 emails a day, they can do a lot more with the rest of the time that they have. They can upskill, they can learn new things, they can get more done during that time, right? So, uh, so that is where this is an enabler in terms of making sure that people are being more productive with their time uh, in uh, getting more done with the time that they have using Gen AI uh, in the enterprise. And what does this mean for the uh, enterprises? Like, what is what 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 do you recommend as a as a person who has been in the data industry for so long in the AI industry? What the, what are your top recommendations in terms of uh, business alignment, uh, right? Uh, management of talent, um, governance. Uh, it could be you know all these factors, right? The, all these strategic decision making. What are some of the things that they need to pre- prepare themselves for? with the technology, not just Gen AI, but that is coming. Yeah, so there is a whole new category of jobs or uh, subcategories of jobs that will come out of uh, the cycle, right? For example, you will need people in your legal teams that understand AI and Gen AI more deeply so they can build better governance structures um, around responsible AI frameworks. Uh, you need products that are around that actually can do the data governance, the data security for all of the data that goes into your models. Uh, you will need uh, a whole new category of what is now being called ML ops or LLM ops of DevOps and SRE people that actually understand how to do the automation uh, for all of this infrastructure. Um, you would need, there's a whole evolving category of engineers called AI engineers uh, who are not quite backend engineers, who are not quite ML engineers in terms of their deeper understanding of ML, but they can actually take ML models and, and productize them and build real products around it with expertise in backend engineering or platform engineering or things like that, right? Uh, that's an evolution that you can get into. Uh, you have data analysts who can now uh, start learning to write prompts really well and and do uh, prompt engineering based uh, fine tuning to get models to perform better. Uh, you can have people with no background in technology whatsoever, people coming with PhDs in English, uh, in linguistics, to come and be able to uh, collaborate with uh, AI ML experts in building uh, products where their understanding of language is a huge asset to how uh, a company builds that product, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Will we reach AGI? <laughs> I think... <laughs> you can choose to not answer. <laughs> no, I think that is the wrong question. I think whenever there's new technology, there is always fear around it. Uh, but interestingly enough, this is the first time where usually when there's new technology, if you don't know anything about the technology, you are afraid of it and you know a lot about the technology, you're like, no, no, this is safe to use. Uh, this is actually the first time where it's inverted. If you don't know anything about the technology, you're really excited. I mean, I love ChatGPT, I can ask it a lot yeah. of questions, right? At the same time, if you're an expert in what the technology is capable of, there is definitely concern from the experts. So that gives me some pause, that if, if they all know what is going on and they're they are afraid of it, there is something there to think about, right? Uh, but I think, Technology in the right hands is an enabler, in the wrong hands has always been a problem. Yeah. That is best left to regulation, I think. A technologist's job All should be... the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anand. Uh, it was a lot of fun to talk uh, about. I know I've been talking about Gen AI with a lot of leaders, obviously, because it's a hot topic. Uh, but I think you have to, this conversation puts, the things, puts a lot of things into perspective uh, with regards to not just the technical aspects of the technology that need to be work that need to work, but also what are some of the changes uh, that enterprises need to be ready to do and implement. Uh, so very insightful. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you.